It says this. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed, and all Israel was dismayed. Now Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. The name of one was Vana, and the name of the other, Rukav. Sons of Rimon, a man of Benjamin from Baeroth. For Baeroth also is counted part of Benjamin. The Barathites fled to Gataim and have been sojourners there to this day. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Now the sons of Rimon, the Barathite, Rechab and Baana, set out, and about the heat of the day they came to the house of Ishbosheth as he was taking his noonday rest. And they came into the midst of the house as if to get wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. When they came into the house, as he lay on his bed in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and beheaded him. They took his head and went by the way of the Arabah all night and brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. And they said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my lord the king this day on Saul and on his offspring. But David answered Rechab and Baana his brother, the sons of Ramon the Barathite, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity, when one told me, Behold, Saul is dead, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more, when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house on his bed, Shall I not now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they killed them, and cut off their hands and feet, and hanged them beside the pool at Hebron. And they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner at Hebron. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful for what it says and all that it means. We're grateful for what it means to us. We're grateful to come together as a church body, to sing praises to your name, to honor your name as holy, to come before you as your servants. We pray that you would, as we gather together around your word, speak to us through it. Speak through me, in place of me even. Preach to us, to our hearts, that we may be stirred up in honor and reverence for you, in worship of you, that our worship might be genuine. Bring us to repentance where we lack it. Give us encouragement where we need it. But more than anything, allow our worship to be true. Pray, Father, that receiving your word, we would be changed. That we would encounter the world with fervor. That we would go out with gusto, preaching the gospel to everyone who will hear it. That we would be bold in our witness. That we would be courageous. That we wouldn't be timid or fearful any longer. But would speak the word with courage and love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm a sports fan, grew up watching professional sports. I grew up in the Dallas area, so it was all professional sports. I didn't realize how much of an argument that was between professional and college until I came here. But, uh, but I grew up watching professional sports, and, and I loved it. And, and growing up in the, in the era of Michael Jordan, I remember seeing Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player that ever lived. If you bring this LeBron James stuff to me, I'm shutting it down, all right? Michael Jordan was the greatest. And, and it just seemed like no matter what he did, 
no matter, no matter what the game was like, there at the end, he was going to find a way to defeat the opponent. It, it didn't matter what the score was, what the odds were against him. It seemed like if he had the ball in his hand, and if he was even marginally healthy, the game was going to be won by him. Other professional athletes, Tiger Woods. Good grief. I watched him win tournament after tournament after tournament. It seemed like he couldn't lose. So many greats that the sports have given to us. And I've loved watching them. But I've started to realize now, it's sort of a surreal feeling. You turn on the TV and all the ones that I grew up watching are no longer there. They've all retired. I, I think it was my dad I was talking to. I said, you know, the, all the ones that I grew up watching, all the greats that I knew of old, they're, they're retired now. And he said, all the ones I grew up watching are dead. <laughs> I think I feel. But it's, it's a surreal feeling, isn't it? That there's this sort of elite club. It's an exclusive club that very few make it into in these professional ranks. But, but even if they do make it in, no one lasts for long. Just a couple of years and, and they're gone. I think it's starting running backs. The average lifespan of a starting running back in the NFL is two years. They don't last for long. They're only at the top for a little while. We get into this passage this morning. And it's a short passage, only 12 verses. And it's certainly very odd. Maybe it causes some of us to be a little bit squeamish. But it gives us a good opportunity to think about first, how are we supposed to read this? What, what am I supposed to do with this? So much of what we do here at Emmanuel is trying to understand how we are supposed to read the Bible. Taking verses very seriously and trying to understand through what lens are we actually supposed to look at this. This is part of the reason Feast exists monthly on those Mondays at lunch is we're trying to ask the question, how do we even study the Bible? What are we looking for? What questions are we asking? I want to go back to the beginning and help maybe give us some lenses through which to look at the passage that we're reading this morning. Otherwise, I don't think it makes much sense. In the Garden of Eden, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, in the Garden of Eden, God was doing much more than just creating an original couple through which all the human race would exist. He was actually creating an original couple through whom he would exercise his rule and his reign over the earth. That was the goal. Genesis 1, 26 to 28, it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. And after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want you to notice something very important in that passage. The man and the woman that God created aren't to subdue the earth in their own image. You understand that? They're not to subdue the earth or have dominion over the earth in their own image. They're not to go out and make their own decisions, make their own uh, rule, make their own law, and have all their children and all the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. They're not to make them obey that law. They're going out in the image of God. They're created in the image of God to subdue and exercise God's dominion over the earth. It's God's dominion that they are to execute. Notice that they are created naively or in naivete. In other words, they're innocent. They don't have the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge 
with which they're to go out and to exercise God's rule and dominion comes straight from God. He's going to tell them what to do. He's going to teach them. And as he teaches them, that is what they're going to execute. They don't have any other knowledge than what he gives to them. They are to teach and instill the worship of God in their children and to ensure that the earth operated under God's perfect justice. So they're created in naivete. They are innocent. They have no knowledge of good and evil. They are given God's permission to go out and execute His dominion over the earth. They are to rule and reign on His behalf in His perfect justice. They're ensuring that their children that come after them are worshiping the Lord day in and day out. So at the beginning of the Bible, what we have is this perfect little picture. It doesn't last long, but it's this perfect little picture of what God's kingdom looks like. God has established His rule, and He has put mankind, Adam and Eve, at its center to be rulers, to rule on His behalf. So God's rule is being instituted through mankind. And this picture is really brief because Adam and Eve can't hold on to it. They're given the charge, but they can't actually hold on to it. God's image is quickly marred when man and woman spoil their natures by taking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They are now no longer innocent, and implementing God's rule over the earth, now they are making their own decisions. They know the difference between good and evil. In fact, this is why God removes them from the Garden of Eden, isn't it? Because they now, like us, know the difference between good and evil. In other words, they're going to begin implementing their own rule over good and evil, over the, over the earth. Now, I've said this before, and I'll, I'll keep, we've kind of gone back to the Garden of Eden a number of times, and we'll, we'll do it uh, forever, uh, until the, the understanding of the Bible comes into sharp focus for us. Because I think if we understand what's happening in the Garden of Eden and the tragedy of the fall that happens afterwards, if we understand that appropriately, the rest of the Bible begins to fall in line for us. Most of the rest of the story of the Bible begins to come into sharp focus. So now we come into 2 Samuel, where David is now established as king, really, you might say, the first ruler over God's kingdom after Adam. So after the fall, God is bringing this whole thing back around and establishing now his king in David. But he is coming from the line of Adam. Nevertheless, he is beginning, the very beginning of establishing God's kingdom again on the earth. And like Adam, he has a very similar mandate. There is one difference, though. You see, Adam was given a mandate to rule the earth, and Adam was created naively, and he was created in perfection. He had no sin. And so when Adam is executing God's rule and reign on the earth, he's spreading that perfect wisdom and knowledge, which he never quite attained. David, on the other hand, is working backwards. David is working with a group of people who are all fallen, who are all sinful, who are under the thumb of the Philistines and under other pagan nations who are, who are completely without God. So David's mandate is something of backwards from Adam, if you will. In other words, he's got to work backwards before he can work forwards. Every king that comes after David, the, the goal is always the same. They all have the stories of the Garden of Eden. That's what they're all wanting to get back to. Isn't that what we're wanting to get back to? Don't we look at Adam and Eve in perfection and go, man, what I wouldn't give to be there. What I wouldn't give to be in marital harmony. Amen? What I wouldn't give to not fight and not argue and not big. Is it just me? No? There's others? Okay. Let's see. Here's some amens, all right? You can amen holy, 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 but you can't amen that. <laughs> Don't leave me hanging out here, all right? <laughs> but David is on the other side of the fall. So he's seeing a nation which is torn apart by sin and all kinds of other things. 
He's seeing a nation which is held under the thumb of the Philistines. And so he's got to unite the people. He has to bring them together. He has to rid them of their opposition, their satanic forces that would seek to oppress them. And then begins the long walk back to the garden. Now, we won't get to 1 Kings. But if we were going to study 1 Kings after 2 Samuel, what you would see there is that when Solomon takes the reins of the kingdom, it it says to us that God gave Israel rest from all its enemies. And it's at that point that Solomon begins to build the temple again. And in the temple, he, he, he decorates it with all these images of the Garden of Eden, right? So David is establishing God's rule and his reign over his people, bringing them together. And then the goal, as always, is working back to perfect harmony with God again. And every king from David on shows promise that this is going to happen. We don't have to start with David. We can go all the way to Noah. There's promise with Noah. He's given the same commission as Adam and he fails. Abraham, not quite. Moses, No. Joshua, no. Judge after judge after judge, no. Samuel, no. Saul, no. David fails. Solomon shows so much promise, builds this temple that looks like the Garden of Eden. We're heading back that way. We've got rest from all our enemies. Mary's pagan woman, pagan woman, pagan woman falls into idolatry. King after king after king after king fails in that long walk back to the garden. What's being proven time and again through the Old Testament is we don't have the ability to do it. What we're going to find out in a few chapters, in chapter 7, God is going to make a promise to David that David isn't going to complete that long walk back to the Garden of Eden. It's going to be, though, one of his descendants. And there's language in that promise that we'll see in a few weeks that that sounds very much like it might be Solomon, David's son, who is going to begin that. And then he builds the temple and it looks promising. But we find out it's not actually Solomon either that's going to accomplish this. But one from David's line will accomplish it. Now, we've seen recently in the beginning of 2 Samuel that we're kind of learning some lessons as to what the kingdom of God looks like. As David begins to establish this reign, it looks very different from the reign of the rest of the world. If you were to just walk into another kingdom out there, the the Assyrians or the Babylonians or, or really anybody else, it would look drastically different. But you remember before David establishes full control over Israel, He has to establish the values of God's kingdom, what God's kingdom is like. And so chapter after chapter after chapter in 2 Samuel, we begin to learn this lesson. David's kingdom and the rule that he's establishing is quite different than what we've seen anywhere else. Remember in 2 Samuel chapter 1, David even makes reference to it here in the passage that we're in this morning. There's an Amalekite that comes to David. And Saul has just been killed. And the Amalekite wants to pretend like he's the one that helped Saul, that assisted in Saul's suicide. And so he tells Saul, hey, you're welcome, by the way. I went ahead and finished Saul off and gave him a little assistance and helped you out because now you have the throne. And David kills him, which is not the reward that he thought he was going to get. For that news, obviously. But David kills him. And what it says about the values of God's kingdom is that this is not one where there are rivalries. God anoints the king and God rules through the king. And you don't have the permission to take the king off the throne. In fact, if you rewind the clocks back to 1 Samuel, David has been learning this lesson over and over at the end of 1 Samuel, didn't he? He he has the opportunity to kill Saul himself. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he learns the lesson not to reach out his hand against the Lord's anointed. So when an Amalekite does it, he has him put to death. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, David is the one that goes before the Lord and says, where do I go now that Saul is dead? What do I do? And he says, says, go to Hebron. And there the nation of Judah will make you king. And so he goes to Hebron and he seeks the Lord's will. The Lord makes him king. 
But that's not what we find with the 11 tribes in the north, is it? Nope. Abner, who is the commander of, the, of Saul's armies, just goes and makes Ishbosheth king. He doesn't care what the Lord wants. That becomes obvious later on. And so what we see is that God's kingdom will be governed by God, not by man. David could have just gone wherever he wanted to and made a decision, but he didn't do that. He sought the Lord's will first. God's kingdom will be governed by God, not by man. And then last week in chapter 3, there's a civil war that is broken out between Judah and Israel. And Abner, the commander of, of the armies of Israel, says, you know what, I'm done with Ishbosheth after false accusation. He goes to David and he wants to join forces with David. And he's going to take all of Israel with him. So essentially at this moment in chapter 3, David has the commander of Israel's armies and all 11 tribes willing to switch their allegiance back to David. So now there's no more civil war. And how does David receive Abner? who has been the opposing general. How does David receive him? Peacefully. He comes in under a white flag, and David does him no harm. Whereas Joab, who is David's right-hand man and nephew, hears that David has accepted the enemy into our territory, and he goes and murders Abner. And David, in turn, mourns the death of the former enemy, Abner, and turns and curses his own man, Joab. Because in God's kingdom, God's king deals mercifully with those who submit to him, but leaves his enemies to the vengeance of the Lord. So you understand that in all of these things that are happening in 2 Samuel, and even going back into 1 Samuel under David, this is unheard of. Nobody does this. No king acts this way. If you go to the Babylonians, do you think that if you killed the king's rival and he's now on the throne, that he's going to hand you over to the gallows to be killed? Absolutely not. Do you think that if you, you as the general of the army, stabbed the other opposing general in the stomach and left him for dead, that the king is going to curse you? Absolutely not. No other kingdom operates this way. David is establishing a whole different rule. And the only way that's fitting for us to understand what he's doing is to look through the lenses of the Garden of Eden at this picture. David is establishing God's rule and he's working backwards or trying to. So we get to our passage this morning, which is a Pretty gruesome passage, and we're going to learn some more things about God's kingdom. First, God's kingdom will not be established by injustice. God's kingdom will not be established by injustice. Look at verses 1 through 4. News of Abner's murder finally reaches the ears of Ishbosheth, who is king of Israel. It says this in verse 1. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed. And all Israel was dismayed. Now Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. The name of one was Bana, and the name of the other was Rechav. Sons of Ramon, a man of Benjamin of Baroth. For Baroth also is counted part of, Ju of Benjamin. The Barothites fled to Gitim and have been sojourners there to this day. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Now, I want you to remember just the last chapter in the first verse. So chapter 3, verse 1, you can look at it. Probably it's right there next to your chapter we're in today. It says, There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. So there's a war going on, this civil war between David's house and Saul's house. Saul's is growing weaker, David's house is growing stronger, and all of that is coming to a close in this chapter here today. Now the question is, how weak is Saul's house actually growing? We are at the very bottom of the weakness of Saul's house. How weak is it? Well, his oldest living son, Ishbosheth, who is king over his kingdom, and has his throne, 
hears of the death of his general Abner, and it says his courage is zapped. It, the Hebrew actually gives a very clear picture of this. It says his, his hands went slack. <laughs> it's a great idiom. It's a great picture for exactly what uh, Ishbosheth looks like at this point. He finds out that his general is dead, and the only thing he can do is drop his hands and realize it's all over. Now remember, Abner carried a lot of power. Abner is the general, he's Saul's cousin, he's Ishbosheth's right hand man, and he is the one that took Saul's crown and put it on Ishbosheth. And when he did that, all 11 tribes in the north switched their allegiance from any king like David all the way to Saul's son Ishbosheth. So that's a tremendous amount of power and authority that Abner had. And now that Abner is dead, that, that's all lost. Well, what about the people that come after Ishbosheth? Well, really, the next in line would be Saul's oldest son, Jonathan, who also died on the field of battle, his son, whose name is Mephibosheth. But we find out in verse 4 that Mephibosheth is incapable of ruling. Why? One, because he's too young. He was five when this episode happened that's described here to us in verse 4. And by the time Ishbosheth is off the throne, he's no older than seven. So he's far too young to rule. And second, there was this tragic accident that happened when he was five. When the nurse learned that Jonathan and Saul had died, she grabbed him up thinking they were after him too, ran, after, ran, ran away, and in the process, he fell, What broke his back, broke his leg, something, and became lame and could no longer walk. So what it's, it, the author is telling us here is that there is a power vacuum. There's a gap. Abner, the most powerful man in the kingdom, is dead. The ruler who's on the throne is a, a puppet, and his marionette has passed away. The only one that would come after him is too young and is lame, can't possibly lead people into battle. So what happens now? We've already seen how much control Abner has over the military, so in his absence, two men who are in the military, Bana and Rakab, two brothers who are captain of the military, rose up, and they decide, we're going to take matters into our own hands. Look at verses 5 to 8. Now the sons of Ramon, the Barathite, Rakab and Bana set out, and about, the, and, and about the heat of the day, they came to the house of Ishbosheth as he was taking his noonday rest. And they came into the midst of the house, as if to get wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rakav and Bana, his brother, escaped. When they came into the house, as he lay on his bed in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and beheaded him. They took his head and went by the way of the Arabah all night and brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. And they said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth. The son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, this day on Saul and on his offspring. So they come in under the pretense of either getting wheat or buying wheat from the household. They come in, uh, the point is, deceptively. They come in, the, the servants let him in the house, and they kill him. The author of the text wants us to clearly understand how foolish these guys are and how pathetic their murder is. They killed the man in his sleep. The equivalent here would be stabbing a person in the back. That's the, that's the English phrase that we would use. You stabbed him in the back. It's, it's not only an act of treason, but it's an act of cowardice. You didn't wait till he was looking at you. Well, these man, men come upon him and kill him in his sleep. Now you can see some similarities in the way Ishbosheth dies and the way his father Saul dies, right? Both of them die by being stabbed in the gut. Both of them are beheaded after they're killed. And both of their supposed murderers meet the exact same fate. And the point that the author is making here is driving home the same central fact. Saul's house is getting weaker and this is the end of it. Saul is done after this. His house is is finished. But here's the humor in this whole scene. These men, these two brothers, they come to David and they give to David a theological assessment 
of the job that they have performed, their achievement. First of all, they said in verse 8, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my Lord the King on this day, on Saul and on his offspring. Look at what good thing we have done. We have taken out, we have cut the head off the serpent. The serpent who was sleeping in his bed. Who it seems has never actually come after David at all. Has never actually made an attempt on David's life. And by all accounts is a puppet king. This man was apparently the head of the serpent. And these two brave warriors have gone into his bedroom while he slept. Have killed him, cut off his head and, bring, and brought it to David. Now, understand, Ishbosheth is weakened by the death of Abner. Abner has already joined David. David has 11 tribes of Israel coming with him. Who does Ishbosheth actually have under his command? Apparently, nobody. The commander of his army is die, has died, and his own army raises up against him. All 11 tribes are coming over to David. Ishbosheth is so weakened by this, he has nobody. Second, Ishbosheth is obviously, militarily, not the strongest. Not only is he not with Saul on the battlefield, in spite of being 40 years old when Saul is fighting, he's not with Saul on the battlefield. That proves that he's not a military genius. And also, he's not in command of his own military. Abner was. So he's weak. The point is, David could have killed this guy anytime he wanted to, and he didn't. David sitting in Hebron and not sending out a raiding party against Ishbosheth is not David's incompetence, it's not David's weakness, it's not his lack of men, it's not his inability to go in and take out Ishbosheth. He's waiting on the Lord. And in all of his waiting, what has happened? The commander of the armies of Israel has come to join forces with him, brought all 11 tribes with him. David has not lifted a finger against Ishbosheth at all. He's content to just wait. And we've seen David learn this lesson over and over and over again. But these guys come to David with Ishbosheth's head in their hands and they claim this theological victory. God has delivered you through us. You are welcome. And the implication is now you should reward us with big, strong, noble positions in your military. God's kingdom will not be established by injustice. And these men reaching out their hand against the Lord's anointed, like it or not, is an injustice. Second, we see God's king will bring his vengeance on the unjust. David is less than impressed, let's say, by the achievement of these guys. Look at verse 9. But David answered Rechab and Benah, his brothers, his brother, the sons of Ramon, the Barathite, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. When one told me, behold, Saul is dead, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house, on his own bed, shall I not now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they killed them and cut off their hands and feet and hanged them beside, hanged them beside the pool at Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner at Hebron. See, David's first response, if you look back at verse 9, is to tell them exactly how he feels about this. I don't need you to save my life. David's life wasn't in danger. But these men are coming under the pretense that what they've done is delivered David, and you're welcome. And David's response is telling, it tells us everything about how he feels about this. I don't need you to save my life. God is the one that delivers me out of the hand of the accuser. David wasn't sitting in his house at Hebron, 
hoping that Ishbosheth caught the flu, broke his leg, lions devoured him in the wilderness. He could have done anything that he wanted to to go in and kill him if he had chosen. Remember in chapter 1, the Amalekite comes to him and he, he has killed or he says he has killed Saul. It's a lie he made up so that he might be rewarded. And we understand that's exactly the way David interpreted, interpreted his coming. That he wanted a reward. And how did I reward him? I killed him. But at least in his story, he made himself out to be a good guy. He made it look like he was doing Saul a favor. If I treated him that way, how am I going to treat wicked men who kill a righteous man in his sleep? Don't go past that. Do you understand what David just called Ishbosheth? A rival king, David just called him a righteous man. Why is that? Well, for one, Ishbosheth is an Israelite, so he's a brother of David. Second, he's Saul's son, he's the anointed king, and he's Jonathan's brother. So David has the utmost of respect for he and his family and likely knew him. They're about the same age anyway. Third, he returned Michael when, Saul, when David sent a letter to, to Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth, without question, sent David's wife back to him. And finally, David is able to understand someone taking a different position than him being on an opposing side of a, the same issue and not being a scoundrel. Well, that's a lesson we could learn not only in the world, but in the church. If someone could possibly be on a different side of an issue from me and I don't have to treat them like an enemy. What a novel concept. David calls Ishbosheth a rival king a righteous man. Again, something that doesn't happen in other kingdoms. But then the question comes, why does he take these two and treat them so badly? I mean, this is not just has them put to death. This is something much worse than that. He takes them outside the camp and does, has his young men do awful things to them. He has them hanged as a sign that they're being cursed by the kingdom. I want to draw your attention to Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 to 23, because I think what David is doing here is actually trying to fulfill the law of God's kingdom. He is trying to put in place God's kingdom and God's rule. And as such, he is bringing God's law to bear and the punishment of God's law to bear on these two men for their crime. Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. What is David doing to these men? It's not just cruel and unusual punishment. Understand what David is bringing to bear on the people here who are part of God's kingdom is the law of God's kingdom. He's seeking to restore justice. When men act unjustly, the king has the right to punish the unjust and to do it by God's law. So these men are going to bear the curse of the law because they've transgressed the law by killing an innocent man in his sleep, no less. But here's what David will come to find out. Here's what Israel will come to find out. Solomon. Every person in God's kingdom, every one of them will come to find out about the harsh reality of the law of God's kingdom as it comes to mankind is that the law that is required to run God's kingdom will effectively leave everyone dead. This is the consequence of what's happened as a result of the fall of Adam. When God's kingdom takes root and begins to set down, and God's law begins to be enacted, what we will see is that every person comes under the curse. And every person, therefore, is going to be left in the wake of God's law. 
every person will be due to be killed. God's kingdom is an exclusive club that everyone is eventually kicked out of. No one can bear the weight of God's law. These men are the first to experience that. They've transgressed God's law. They've ignored God's justice. They've acted unjustly. And therefore, they bear the curse of God's law. But you have to understand, this is the beauty of what's happened in Christ. Not only is He God's King who has set God's kingdom down, but and sitting God's kingdom down and the law of God's kingdom down on earth, He has also understood simultaneously that in doing so, you are going to be a victim. You're going to be plowed over by it. Jesus comes in on the Sermon on the Mount and he begins to say, You've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say to you, if anyone looks after a woman lustfully, he has committed adultery with her in his heart. You've heard it said, don't commit murder, but I say to you, if anyone's angry with his brother, you've already committed murder with in your heart. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, look, if the law of God's kingdom were really followed, every single one of you would be dead. At the end of Matthew chapter 5, he says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. What's the result of that? Casualty. Anyone in here lining up to enter into the kingdom of God? What happens when Christ sets the kingdom down is he not only, as king, executes God's law, but then, as man, turns around and faces the force of the wrath of God's law. He becomes the curse so that you don't have to be. Because you couldn't bear the weight of God's law. Everyone would be a casualty. And to prove that point, when Paul explains this to us in Galatians 3.13. He tells us that Christ became the curse for us. Look at Galatians 3.13. It should appear on the screen behind me. It says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. You realize what Paul is citing there? Paul is citing the passage where these two scoundrels who killed Ishbosheth in his sleep, become an example of being cursed by the law. And he's saying that right there is also Christ. Does Christ ultimately step into the shoes of David and surpass everything that David could possibly hope to do in bringing his people back to the Garden of Eden and bringing people, his people into the kingdom of God? Absolutely he does. But he does so Not from a kingly position, sitting on his throne, commanding you, come into the kingdom. No, he goes down where you are and bears the curse of God's kingdom on his own shoulders. Because he knows you can't. And then he brings you into the kingdom under his cloak. Here's what that means. God's kingdom, if you are in Christ has come to you by grace. It's not of your own doing. It is a gift of God so that no one can boast. Because if Christ laid down the law of the kingdom in front of you, you couldn't perform it. If the righteousness that is required to enter God's kingdom was set down in front of you, you couldn't do it. So the only way that it could happen is for Christ to not only lay down the law of the kingdom, but then bear the punishment on his own shoulders and offer it to you by faith, trusting in Christ's sacrifice on your behalf, trusting in the forgiveness that he provides. And if that is you, if you are included in Christ's kingdom, then it has come to you strictly by God's grace and his mercy to you. It hasn't come to you by something that you've done. It hasn't come to you by performance. It hasn't come to you because of how good you are. So now, because I have inherited Christ's kingdom, 
by His grace and mercy and not of my own doing. It has inspired me to actually live according to His will. You see, He doesn't tell me, hey, you got to be good first and then you can come in. He brings me in and teaches me how to obey. So my obedience is a result of my inclusion in Christ's kingdom, not in order to get in. And if that's the case, then it's incumbent on us to put away the filth that's in our own life. We call ourselves a part of Christ's kingdom. But do we go home and turn to the same images on the screen in front of us? Turn back to the same lust time and again. Follow the same anger and bitterness. The same frustration. The same lack of contentment. It's incumbent upon us because of the grace and mercy of God that He has bestowed to us in Christ. Graciously bringing us into His kingdom. To put away the garbage in our own lives. To submit to Christ as King. But it also tells us, because Christ has done all of this, because He is the one that bore the curse, because He is the King over the kingdom, because He has done all the work to bring us in, what should I expect will happen in the days to come? Do I look at the world around me and do I think to myself, Well, he's really lost control over this one now. I'm tempted to. I'm tempted to turn on the TV or look on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, social media, and find example after example the world's going to hell in a handbasket. But it turns out The same one that graciously included me into his kingdom has put before me a task. And there's only so much that I can do. And I can look at all the stuff that's going on around the world and I can be overwhelmed by it and I can get on my keyboard and I can rage tweet and kind of put all kinds of things on Facebook and I can defame the name of Christ by the words that I put out there on the screen. Or I can be content with what he has sent And I can tend my own garden. There's certain tasks that he has put before you, Christian. And there's certain things that he has not given to you. And he he has given you all the tools necessary. All the gifts necessary. He's given you this garden and he's established its parameters. He's given you the fertilizer. He's given you the weed control. He's given you all the things that you need to do that he expects you to use. And it's so tempting to look out there in the rest of the world over beyond our fence and go, I wish I had that part of the garden that I could really, because I could really do something about those weeds over there. That's not what he's given you. He's given you a task. That's what he wants you to handle. Doing anything more than what he's established as your boundaries is trying to take control of this kingdom and work unjust, unjustly. I think also the goriness of this passage in the Old Testament, it sometimes makes parents cringe. And I hear about it. I hear about it in my own house. We get to passages like this, and you're like, can we just skip past some of that stuff? And it, and it works, it seems, against what we have set out to do with our kids at home, doesn't it? We, we've wanted to avoid violence and, and, you know, close our eyes with the previews come up, and we don't want to see, you know, gory violence and all that kind of stuff. But you understand there is a difference between the depiction of gratuitous violence and what is happening in the violent stories in the scriptures. That if we have the lenses of the Garden of Eden, as we're looking at this passage, then what this tells us is that all of this judgment that is enacted by God's King is but a foretaste of the judgment that is to come. So son and daughter, this is a warning to you. Unbeliever, sitting outside of Christ's kingdom, looking in, perhaps you're here 
and you're, you're looking in the window of God's kingdom. Perhaps you're observing all these people singing praise and worship and you're not quite sure if this is true. What you're seeing here in God's king executing justice on the unjust is but a foretaste of what is to come. When Christ returns, He will bind all those who are outside of His kingdom and He will throw them into an eternity in hell. So we can wipe away this mentality of the hippie Jesus who sits up in heaven and just wants peace and love and everybody to be okay. We can wipe away this theology that the world wants to put out there that says, look, how could a God who is so loving ever send anyone to hell? Make no mistake about it. We have precursor after precursor in the Old Testament. We have Jesus' own words in the Gospel. And we have Him doing it in Revelation that when He returns, He will bind up all evildoers, all unbelievers into an eternity in hell. This is but a foretaste. You understand it as a warning. What you see on the movie screens is gratuitous violence that you should shield your eyes from and you should protect your children from. But when we see it here in the Bible, there is a gospel interpretation that goes along with that violence that says, be warned. Hell is real. and God's king will execute justice on the unjust. So son, daughter, repent. God's king is here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent before hell becomes all too real. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a task that we have before us in just managing the responsibilities that you've given to us. I pray that you would give us help You have given to us everything that we could possibly ever ask or need. And you have told us if there's anything that we can possibly think that we need, we should ask it. And you'll provide. So we pray that you would give us courage, willingness, that you would give us help to do what you've called us to do. As citizens of your kingdom, having brought us in by your grace and mercy, Bring us to a place where we continue to rely on your grace and mercy given to us each and every day to perform the tasks that you have set before us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.